I want to begin with this. And men, I just want to focus on you. But my gosh, women, you will have an opinion on this as well. But here's the question for the men. Do you find it more difficult to have emotional relationships with your mates than women do? And why is that? Why is it that your girlfriend, your partner, your wife seems to have a closer, more tight knit, deeper female friend group than you have a male friend group? Now, if you don't see any difference in the two, all good. This next 50 minutes or so is probably not for you. But while I was reading this book, so many things became sobering. I immediately put the book cover on one, two of my WhatsApp groups, which are male only, to ask us to put a mirror up to our own friendships and whether they are real friendships or not. Whether we're putting the work in. One of the things that I do when I moved from London to the northwest of England, I dragged my wife and kids away from their security group kids away from their friends luckily they were young enough and they've made new friends but my wife and it has been difficult for her and one of the things that I've said to myself and perhaps lied to myself and after reading this book maybe I have lied to myself and men tell me if you can relate is that oh well women need friendships more than men they need to speak to each other all the time we don't need to do that we can spend six months away and then just pick up where we left off. Reading this book, I'm not sure that's the case anymore. And maybe, as indeed Max Dickens, who wrote this brilliant book, said, a lot of this is about being in denial, lying to yourself, thinking that you don't need the things that actually your wife, your girlfriend, your partner does need, and they're very open about it, and they talk to their friends about it. And do men. So... Indulge me. Tell me. Do you think you have as strong emotional relationships with your mates as your wife, your girlfriend, your partner does with her female friends? What do you think? 08085 909 Text me on 85058. Tweet us at BBC Five Live. Max Dickens, welcome to the show, sir. Oh, thank you so much for having me, and thank you for sharing my book on your WhatsApp groups. That's amazing. <laughs> well, it's... I just realised that a lot of these guys... OK, here's the thing, Max, is yeah. we got loads of pals, mm. right? If we want to get on the banter bus, <laughs> we got, we've all got tickets, right? <laughs> it's good, right? But when it gets a little bit darker, when I'm a little bit more emotionally in need of someone to talk about, talk to sorry about usually what's going on with my wife and I yeah or how unhappy I am at work or life that that group shrinks mm. considerably it shrinks but Max let, let's start with you because this is after all this hour is about you um why did this come into focus for you what was it about falling in love deciding to get married <laughs> yeah. that brought this into focus well I think friendship, you don't really think about it until you need it, especially if you're a guy, because we don't really talk about this stuff. We don't really think about our friendships, don't really talk about them. So my situation was I was planning on proposing to my then girlfriend. I went as far as going into a hat and garden jewellers to look for a ring with a... <laughs> surrounded uh, by other men. Surrounded by other men. Equally all... <laughs> lost. Yes, so I so I've got book, no yeah. idea. Emerald, <laughs> diamond, gold, platinum. Someone save me. Wandering around, <laughs> wide-eyed, punch drunk. Um, and then we, we sort of had a look and then we went to the pub afterwards, me and a female friend who I took basically to hold my hand and <laughs> show me what to buy. <laughs> And she said, so, you know, you're going to propose, who's your best man going to be? And I fobbed off the question. I thought, oh, my mind's just gone blank. It just must be in the moment, you know. And I went back that night, got a bit of paper out. I went, right, who are my top ten male friends? And it took me ages. And when I looked at the list, I worked with most of them. And I don't think they'd be comfortable with me asking them to be my best man. And then the rest of them I hadn't seen in some cases for two or three years or had that feeling of we were mates, but I didn't really know them on any sort of deeper level and absolutely vice versa. 
And I thought, gosh, does any other guy have this problem? And you can Google getting married, no best man. And there's millions and millions of results from men sort of reaching out, looking for help. And there's tons of stats. So the Movember Foundation recently did some research. One in five men say they've got no close friends. If you ask a group of men how many people have they you got... They said one in three, didn't they? One in three, right? Yeah, so, that's right, yeah. So, so there's another survey as well, one in five, one in three, even worse. Yeah, That right. same Movember survey asked to guys, who can you talk to about anything serious, like health worries, money worries, relationship worries? Half of them, so one in two, could think of nobody at all. And that is, I mean, it's not healthy, and it's not great for, uh, just for us, our sense of well-being, our happiness, our... Our, our, our juice in life. So I set about going, well, how do I find a best man? But really, it was a bigger question. How do I solve my friendship problem and become the sort of man that people can be friends with? Fascinating. Right, come back to that in a little bit, Max. But mm. before that, let's cross to the Oval One Day International. Ellie is there watching, uh, going, going swimmingly for England, I believe. It's going brilliantly. Yes, they've <laughs> lost three wickets in the first 15 minutes of this game. Uh, Jason Roy, Joe Root, Ben Stokes all back in the pavilion with ducks against their name. Jasprit Bumrah has taken two. Uh, Mohamed Shami's taken the other. Two catches for Rishabh Pant. Johnny Bairstow is still there. He's on five. But England are seven for three in 2.4 <laughs> overs. This is the first of three ODIs that England and India are playing over the next uh, few days. And uh, England, of course, will be in India next year to defend their 50 over world title but uh, yeah India are I think you'd say well and truly on top so far here Nihal. Uh, where are you positioned in comparison to the Bharat army they're always the very noisy the brilliant Bharat army who support India wherever they go I think there are, there are pockets of the Bharat Army spread around, actually. There's definitely a, quite a good pocket just in front of me here in uh, the JM oh, Finn stand. Fun. So, so down, down to the right. Yeah, but I, think, I don't think they've actually completely woken up yet. I think they've entirely <laughs> realised what's going on because it's just so ridiculous. But, but cru crucially on a day like this, Nihal, I'm positioned in an air-conditioned commentary box, which is extremely nice because it is sultry out there yeah. it is warm it's humid it's not all that sunny um and england are well they're sweating out there at the moment uh, not bad playing conditions for indians then Very not at all thing okay ellie thank you we'll go back to you later on ellie aldroyd there at the oval for england's first one day international against india back to billy no mates this is the name of the book how i realize men have a friendship problem so that's interesting those surveys okay Loneliness, right, is an important word here. But I think you make a fascinating distinction between rather the comparing genders. Mm. You know, are men lonelier than women? Are women lonelier than men? You ask this question, how are men lonely? Yeah, absolutely. So um, men's loneliness, um, there are certain risk factors that affect everyone in terms of you're more likely to have less friends if certain things happen, for example, retirement or bereavement or divorce or you move to a different place. But if you look at the stats, post-divorce, post-bereavement, post-retirement, loneliness affects men a lot more than women because um, they tend to rely on work and on their wife or girlfriend for their social network, for their friendships. So when you get untethered to those things then you're left much more isolated. And, and it, men face two problems with friendship. One we've kind of explored. They might have lots of mates, pub mates, football mates, but they lack intimacy, like that real closeness in their friendships. And as they get older, their, their social network shrinks, and it shrinks much more than women does because men seem to be not quite as good at maintaining friendships and also at building new ones. Yeah, so let's, let's talk a bit more about network shrinkage, which is nothing to do with your mobile phone. <laughs> provider is it um in our 20s men have bigger friendship groups is that right yeah so if you look at the at the data men te seem to have bigger social groups than women in the mid-20s by the time they got into their mid-40s that's flipped on its head it's completely reversed so a number of people have already got in contact with us joel has tweeted me hi joel saying great debate this hour guys with a communication problem often have that compounded if they are single um, and also Neil Kaur has just pointed to me towards a piece um, that's on YouTube called The Best Man, Male Friendship in the 21st Century. It is something that is out there, but something we're singularly bad at talking about. 
yeah, I mean, that's also kind of the problem, right? This is where it all comes down to. We won't talk about the issue. And because we can't talk about things full stop, maybe we never get we never get off the banter bus and go into, uh, I don't know, intimacy petrol station. Or however you want to phrase it. <laughs> yeah, it's quiet. <laughs> um, uh, OK, friendship has a rhythm and I had lost it. Talk, talk to me about that. In yeah. Thought, can you say that? So. What I mean by the friendship rhythm is you're in the habit of messaging people, meeting up. Those meetups lead up to another meetup. You're texting. There's there's a momentum to it. There's there's the habit of having friends you're up with. Once you get out of the habit, it's, it's a lot harder to get back into it. And I found that these friends I hadn't seen for ages, I'd kind of opted out of those friendships to focus on other stuff. And because I wasn't in the loop there, if I wasn't in, in the habit of contacting them, and especially vice versa, you just stop getting asked to parties if you don't turn up to them ever. I, I found that it felt almost starting again in my, in my 30s to kind of get back to that sense of uh, momentum. So what do you think of, you know, what I said at the beginning was that, and reading this book has made me, question whether I'm being true to myself or not as indeed many times throughout this book you question whether you're being true to yourself or not mm. is this idea that well women need their friends more than we do right so yeah of course my wife needs to speak to her mates every day I thought I didn't yeah but I th actually I think I do yeah well that's exactly how I felt and how and I mean on on, on the one hand you can look at stats around male mental health they're pretty well known now so suicide the biggest cause of death of men under 45 we've, we've had this conversation a lot men, men don't talk about stuff but they don't have people to disclose to to invest to apart from maybe a wife or girlfriend who what we'll call our wives often now our best friends and that's brilliant but we don't have other avenues there is another angle here though which i think is interesting do men need those close friendships i think they absolutely do people they can disclose to have these proper conversations with but men also i think define what closeness looks like sometimes differently to women so you know i got an email this morning from a, a man who'd read something i'd written and he's in the army and he said you know being with my um, comrades on the battlefield or going through that process that felt to me like real intimacy now they weren't talking about their feelings all the time and i think there's a lot of merit to that as well but men definitely need some avenues for this other sort of deeper conversation. Well, I found it fascinating, though, that when you talked about a friendship with Jules at university, yeah, right. Lurking here, however, is an assumption that close friends are the people you bear your soul to. But when I thought about my friendship with Jules, you write in the book, Max, without doubt, one of the most meaningful of my life, talking about our feelings, barely came into it. Yeah, absolutely. So Jules um, was somebody I was in a. I met through on the stand-up comedy circuit. We were in a then entered a double act, and we were doing tour shows, Edinburgh festivals, bits and bobs of TV, and that shared adventure, that sense of oh my gosh, we're doing it, we're doing the thing we always dreamed of, and seeing us ourselves actually really vulnerable, rather than talking about our feelings, showing each other, being nervous, being scared, being exhilarated by what we were experiencing. That closeness was a very different sort of closeness, but maybe one we don't recognise. And if you look at the st those stats we talked about, Nihal, about you know one in three men have no close friends and those questions about who can you talk to serious stuff about, that sort of closeness is not reflected in those stats. And so maybe we don't understand male friendship in the 21st century. It's, it's I had a, so pertinent to this conversation, Max, that I was talking to my son, who's 14, about this this morning. And he was talking about how men need to be resilient. Mm. Right. And that, you know, sharing and he goes to an all boys school. So he said it's quite difficult. It's very laddie where he goes to school. It, it, interestingly, I was looking at some stand up you did, actually, the Chortle Student Awards, right, from about 12 wow, years ago. was it in black and white? 12, 12 years. No, it was interesting because, and I don't know if you were just, this was for um, stand up <laughs> purposes or not, but you said your dad was very masculine. <laughs> yeah, my dad is 6'8", uh, former rugby player, 
and what came okay. through an all boys school like right. I did. So I went to an all boys school like your your boy. And he, it is kind of a laddie atmosphere. It's boy to the power of boy, right? So everything gets amplified. And I do think this is we're going to maybe getting into it. Then is it's the performance of being a man that you have when you're around men, especially around pure men. And and that age of teenager is is very laddie. And there's some fun stuff with that. But also, I think you learn some bad habits. And I really noticed that in myself. Like My, my wife, uh, my, my now wife, we went to a party when I was researching all this stuff. And she said, do you realise what you're like with men? You just become a completely different person. I don't recognise that person in the other side of the room around f- when you're surrounded by four blokes. I, I put on this mask, this performance of what, what it is to be a bloke. Mm. Um, Alison has just tweeted me, Max, say, who are all these women who have to talk to friends every day? I don't, and I don't know many women who do. Sounds like a male stereotype of women to me. Mm. Uh, And that's absolutely fair. But we are going to deal in generalities here um, because, but the data points in a certain direction, Alison, and you're absolutely right. The data, as far as I'm aware, does not point in the direction that women need to speak to their female friends. That is purely anecdotal from my wife and seemingly all of her friends <laughs> who speak far more regularly to each other than I do with my pals. Yeah. You know, it's, it's borne out in a lot of research as well. So it's a, so I, I spoke to a, a world expert of friendship, a guy called Dr. Robin Dunbar. He's very famous evolutionary anthropologist, the godfather of friendship research. And he, he explained the differences between male and female friendship archetypally are males tend to be shoulder to shoulder, side by side, based around sharing space, sharing activities, doing stuff together. Then if you look at female friendships, they tend to be face-to-face, based around uh, talk and a degree of emotional disclosure, much more intense than male friendships. Now, are there female friendships that look different? Absolutely. And we are talking generalisations, but they are different male and female friendships. And at the extremes of these um, archetypes, I think you get behaviours that are probably not very healthy, as we're talking about with men today. Um Sam, who's in Cambridge and is 24 years old, has texted in. Hey, Sam. I've never had close friends, but found that I like the solitude. Friends are hard work and cause headaches. Is there any circumstance where having no friends as a man is actually beneficial? Well, this is an interesting text because of something you say in the book, Max. Mm. Antisocial kind of as a mirage for loneliness that you would argue to Naomi you go oh yeah I'm just antisocial that's what you know I don't, I don't really fancy it but actually that's not really what it is yeah I think we I, I sort of fetishize solitude uh, in maybe a slightly pretentious way and I'm not suggesting this is true of Sam uh, at, uh, at no. the moment but I think that again it's another form of mask right another thing we maybe do to put off the conversation or not self-reflect I should say there's not a perfect number of friends whatever the no. number of friends you want is fine no. but it's the quality of the, the quality is massively important yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I just reflected on all these ways I avoided confronting the problem. I, a classic one was I was always busy. So I was hanging out with uh, Naomi, who was my girlfriend, then hanging out with all her friends. I was busy with work. I was doing family stuff. And it was only when I slowed down a bit and looked at it, I was like, oh, man, I've got no friends. That is a sobering realisation, isn't it? And tell us about the analysis then of your own complicity in that Mm. does it begin with your own complicity in it or does it begin with you trying to look for reasons why it's someone else's fault i think my instinct was to blame somebody else straight away or actually to blame the modern world i don't have friends because i haven't got any time i don't have any time because everything's so fast and everything's so difficult now but really what when I looked at it, I, I had to reflect on what I thought it was to be a man and how I was manifesting that in the world. And I thought it was this idea of masculinity is talked about a lot. I thought that was other people, the bad form of masculinity, people like Harvey Weinstein, like terrible people. But then when I reflected on how it had affected me coming through an all-boys school, how I was being a man, I then realised, you know what, it is my fault. I am... I am complicit in this and these behaviours, these ways I've learnt how to behave are getting in the way of me having great relationships. They're getting in the way of me being a good friend to other people, a good husband, um, a good son, a good everything. Um, Talk to me about emotional labour. Yeah. 
And then moving on from that, manned holding, which, <laughs> wow. When that is given a name, that is my life. Okay, but emotional labour, let's talk about that. For so you. emotional labour, in a nutshell, is essentially... Uh, is understood as the uh, as the work women do to keep everything together in family and friendship groups or for the husband. All the stuff around remembering things or doing the planning, the organising, the thinking. So they're the one that buys the card when you're going to a birthday party. They're the one who organises what's happening on New Year's Eve or you go on holiday and you need to book a restaurant and you, the, the guy might go, oh, we should go out for dinner. And then who ends up booking it tends to be the woman in that arrangement. So manholding is sort of quite a funny compound word of man and hand-holding, which kind of reflects that idea, right? Which we're... Often as guys, we let ourselves be mummied a little bit. And uh, I realised, look, I did that a lot in my real life. So like around the house, for example. But also um, in, in friendships, we do that. We, I, we often delegate all the social work to our female partners. They're like the director of people operations at Jeff Limited. They, they organise all the parties. They, uh, they, they introduce us to their friendship group. And we can freeload on that and forget to do it ourselves. And if you think about male friendships, if both sides of that equation aren't doing that sort of work, emotional labour, if you like, then no wonder friendships drift or we sit in this holding pattern where none of us really do anything about it, even though we really want to be friends with one another. Max Dickens, stay with us. Fascinating conversation. Tom Green, uh, a radio presenter from Radio X, has just uh, tweeted us saying this conversation is absolutely fascinating, a much-needed insight 85058 is the text number you can also tweet me personally directly on my timeline if you wish to people are doing that but i would really like to hear from you as well about this conversation of male friendships and why we're just not very good at it and why it is vitally important that we learn to be better at it because it has huge benefits for us and I'm not talking about the amount of people you can have a laugh with, as Max pointed out, sat side by side, not face to face, but side by side, arm around each other, doing shots. Right. That's not <laughs> I can, you can find complete strangers who do that with you on, a, on any given night. Trust me on that. I'm talking about something deeper, something more emotional. Think about a man in your life that if it was all on top, if you were sad, if you were low, if you felt bereft in some way, that you would call up. Now, if you're struggling to do that, then we definitely have a problem. If perhaps that's just one person, then that's good that that's one person. But this is what this book, Billy No Mates, How I Realise Men Have a Friendship Problem, is all about. And I have to say, it's, it's, it's very funny. I mean, Max is a comedian, so you would expect it to be. So there are parts of it that are laugh out loud funny. It's not like you sit there going, oh, my gosh, this is a relentless bore. But I haven't been as excited by a book that has really kind of resonated with me personally since I read Johan Hari's book, Stolen Focus, or Rutger Bregman's book, Humankind, both of which are brilliant books. Uh, Billy No Mates is up there. So please get in contact with us. Tell us about your male friendships and why you think it is that men are so difficult to or men find it so difficult <laughs> I could just have stopped men are so difficult <laughs> my wife would have called in we spent an hour and a half just doing that but anyway 85058 is the text number 08085 909 693 on whatsapp okay 32 minutes past one we'll carry on this conversation after we get the headlines with dan brennan listen on bbc sounds this is bbc radio five live thanks to hal good afternoon the former chancellor rishi sunak says he wants to restore trust rebuild our economy and reunite the country as he launches his bid for the tory leadership jacob rees mogg and nadine doris have come out and backed liz truss all the candidates have until six this evening to gather enough support that's at least 20 mps to go further in the contest there's been praise for Sir Mo Farah after he opened up about being brought to the UK illegally as a child and forced to work as a domestic servant. The Olympic champion has told the BBC he was flown over from East Africa when he was nine by a woman he'd never met. Heathrow Airport says it's introducing a cap of 100,000 daily departing passengers until September the 11th. It comes as the airline industry struggles to cope with demand for travel, partly because of staff shortages. 
And the Welsh Parliament will vote later on reducing the speed limit in built-up areas from 30 to 20 miles an hour from next year. The Welsh Government hopes it will reduce crashes and traffic noise and encourage people to walk and cycle. That's your latest news. Let's get the sport. Here's Della Floyd. Thank you, Dan. England have had an absolute nightmare start in their first one-day international against India at the Oval. Elna Aldroyd is watching. Yes, it's been a shocker there. 22 for four in the seventh over here. Uh, latest wicket to fall was uh, that of Johnny Bairstow, who made seven before he was caught brilliantly by Rishabh Pant of Jasprit Bumrah. Bumrah has taken three wickets and England's heroes of the Test Series against India, all returning for this game, and uh, seven between them. And that all went to Bairstow. Root and Stokes out for a duck. Roy also out for a duck. He's looked pretty out of touch so far in this uh, series, or these two series against uh, India. Joss Butler hit his first Two balls for four, so he's on eight. Liam Livingston is the new batter. He is yet to get off the mark. And India, having chosen to bowl first, are reaping the rewards. They're uh, England 22 for four, and we are in the seventh over. Yeah, it's meant to be a day-night match. Whether we'll get that far remains to be seen. Thank you, Ellie. Coverage continues over on Five Sports Extra. Meanwhile, Ireland are currently 92 for five in the 31st over against New Zealand. That's in the second one day in Dublin. Tiger Woods says he doesn't know how many Open Championships he has left at St Andrews, nor what his career is going to look like. Woods still has some lingering effects of the severe leg injuries he suffered in a car accident in February last year. The three-time Open champion who triumphed at St Andrews in 2000 and 2005 is, though, happy to be there this week. It feels more historic than it normally has, and it's hard to believe that, you know, because we are coming back to the home of golf, and it is history every time we get a chance to play here. And, you know, it's hard to believe it. It's been 150 years we played this tournament. It's just incredible, the, the history behind it, the champions that have won here. That This does feel like it's the biggest Open Championship we've ever had. Well, let's cross live to the course, because Woods has an interesting matchup for the first and second rounds, Ian Carter. He does, and what a reward for the US Open champion, Sheffield's Matt Fitzpatrick, because he's going to be teeing it up with Woods, twice a champion at St Andrews. And the up-and-coming American Max Homer makes up that three ball. They tee off at 2.49 on Thursday afternoon. The honour of striking the first tee shot is going to the 1999 champion Paul Laurie at 6.35 in the morning. Rory McIlroy accompanies the defending champion Colin Morikawa at 9.58. And the 2019 champion Shane Lowry enjoys a high-profile billing in the following group alongside the PGA champion Justin Thomas and Norway's Victor Hovland. Ian, thank you. Our golf correspondent Ian Carter there. We'll have coverage from a Five Live Breakfast on Thursday. Wales winger Rabi Matondo has joined Rangers on a four-year deal from Schalke for an undisclosed fee. While Wolves are close to their first signing of the summer, the Burnley defender Nathan Collins is having a medical today ahead of a proposed £20.5 million move to Molyneux. Manchester United face Liverpool in Bangkok shortly in a pre-season match. It'll be the first game in charge for the incoming United boss Eric Ten Hag, who started the job in May after joining from Dutch side Ajax. The standard of Manchester United is to win every game. So we will start with that in our mind. We will be determined, determined, determined and we are looking forward and this is a really good test for us. Game kicks off at two o'clock and in Rugby Union, Ireland have beaten the Maori All Blacks by 30 points to 24. That's the latest from BBC Sports. F1. The winner was Charles Leclerc for Ferrari. For the first time since the 10th of April, the Ferrari team finally managed to take a victory. It wasn't all plain sailing. They should have had a 1-2, but Carlos Sainz's engine blew up with about 10 laps to go, costing him second place and meaning Verstappen finished in second position. A good day for Mercedes. Lewis Hamilton finishing third, George Russell finishing fourth. A good haul of points for the Mercedes team. This time, it's personal. F1. Get reaction and analysis from the Austrian Grand Prix with Five Lives Checkered Flag Podcast. Leclerc takes the victory and closes the championship advantage on Max Verstappen. Available now on BBC Sounds. BBC Radio 5 Live. I listen every day. I trust the presenters. There are lots of people calling us tonight. Bowls to Stokes who hammers it for four. The voice of the UK. Nahal Arthanaika. BBC Radio 5 Live. Listen on BBC Sounds. Thank you for doing so. Uh, Max Dickens is my very special guest. He's written a book called Billy No Mates, have, How I Realised Men Have a Friendship Problem. And my gosh, you've started a conversation, Max. Good. My gosh, my Twitter timeline is uh, is is blowing up loads of texts as well. Um, 
Texter uh, Jurgen Klopp Dog has said, uh, this is such an interesting conversation. In my 20s, I was in a little band playing football, still close with friends from college. But as they moved to adulthood, marriage and kids, I felt like a spare wheel. It was me that became distant from my male friends. Uh, Mike Lewenden, hi Mike, said, I'm a decorator who works alone and any males I socialise with are all husbands of my um, wife's friends. I have no true men friends and never have. And I think or tell myself it's OK and I'm happy with that. I probably am not. Great interview with Max. Um, Joel, uh, again, said, I'm not certain many men even think about their lack of communication till it hits them in the form of loneliness. Many may not see communication either as one of the cornerstones of well-being until they become mildly depressed. Um, Jan Skate said male friendships or the lack of hugely triggering conversation on Five Live with Max Dickens. Uh, book Billy No Mates. I'm a serial friend loser. Is it because we always seek the new, a compulsion to expand, meet new people? Or is that just me? Oh, <laughs> wow. Max, you have started a big conversation. We're going to be speaking to Richard in Harrogate in a moment. But did you think, I mean, you've already said this, actually, that when you couldn't find a best man, you may have initially thought, geez, this is me. This is just me. Yeah, I absolutely did. And I didn't really want to tell anyone, even tell my then girlfriend. I was trying to keep the proposal secret, but I, I did eventually say, look, I'm really worried I haven't got any male friends, but it's so embarrassing to talk about. But really, it, it shouldn't be. It's just um, if you don't talk about it, other people feel lonely within their loneliness. So I'm glad today people are texting in, tweeting in, calling in, so we can just make this less of a taboo because stuff can be done about it. It's in our hands. But the first thing is we've got to confess it. Well, let's speak to Richard, who's in Harrogate. Hi, Richard. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you, sir. Um, so let, let's tell us about the, the relationships that you built up, the friendships that you built up in the RAF. Tell us how you think that worked, how you became so close. Uh, yeah, I, I was in the RAF uh, uh, nearly 30 years um, and you sort of get thrown together and I think because you you sort of face face a few difficult situations you, you get to trust people and I, I had lots of very very close friends um, just from working with them but we would also we work, we'd socialise, we'd go away and I really relied on them and they meant a lot to me. Um, but then I, I left the RAF and I found that really, really difficult. I found that um, the people talk about that sort of lock, loss of community and, and I was alert to that. But until it actually happens, it's really, really difficult to, to understand. And then when you're going through it, I, I did, you know, your Max's conversation about loneliness, then that definitely... That, that kicked in for me. Who did you tell that you were lonely, Richard? Um, I don't know that I told anyone. Actually, my, I, I did speak to my sister about it, but that seemed quite quite strange. So there wasn't a single man that you told about this, not one? I sort of touched on it, but it, I think it was only a bit bit later on. I sort of, I was changing jobs and, you know, relationship breakdown, and it was only... A couple of people, I think, saw what was going on. A couple of my close mates that I stayed in touch with. Um, and From I your RAF in... days? Yeah, exactly. Right. But um, my those friends were sort of, you know, they're around the UK, around the world, and they're not around the corner, most of them. So you, you can't go around and have a cup of tea or whatever. And I I think it was a couple of, a couple of people in particular just sort of stuck their arm around me a few years later and said yeah you know we saw what was going on and um and they had always been there you know they were they would call me up and those things but it yeah i think that i have i know part of your discussion is some people finding it difficult to make friends i think when you have made friends and then you're in an environment where it's harder to make friends then that contrast is is really difficult max is nodding along in agreement there because you don't strike me max as someone who would actually would find it difficult to make friends. 
Yeah, I'm pretty outgoing, and I'm. Uh, he said, <laughs> having literally written a book called Billy No Mates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that but that's the point, isn't it? Yeah, it's it, about connecting with people is one thing superficially. It is, and to speak to Richard's point, Richard, thank you for sharing your story. It's really interesting, and, and thank you for, for for being so vulnerable. I think friendship, when you enter middle age, you'll get beyond it. And I've found this, and I reflected on... We talked about my friendship with Jules and that time of life when I was on the comedy circuit, really missing that, yearning for it. But I think we almost have to let go of certain times of our life and not bring rules of what our new friendships will be so we can open ourselves up to them. But the second thing is, I think maybe more importantly, is friendship, especially for men, relies on structure, routine, ritual so how can we rebuild those habitats you you can't rebuild the raf right but what <laughs> other thing could you do like for me as a very small example nowhere near raf level but you know organized um fortnightly five aside thing with my friends but it was in the diary all the time um robin dunbar who i mentioned before i asked him what's your one big tip he said join a club right mm. because it'd be people who are into what you're into it's it's in it's a structure that you can it makes that making friends a bit easier so rather than relying on spontaneity it's how can we give ourselves some training wheels or a, or a, some space around us to make it more lightly that's true that's very very true um did you know there's a harrogate ex servicemen's club richard uh i did and i i haven't been along to it i i sort of i don't know in some ways when you leave you leave is is sort of the way i look at it and it's almost like trying to hang on to the past it's interesting what max says about let go of the past but then i had a a conversation last week completely unrelated where someone said oh are you a member of any clubs and and i'd always been members of club clubs a member of clubs and i wasn't and i think it was only that stark question of are you a member of a club and just saying no and it I don't know. Maybe, maybe that is the way for the, for the future. Mm, mm. But it's not. I, I get totally what you're saying about you know you don't want to just meet up with loads of ex servicemen and just talk about your experiences. But there are new friendships and new experiences to be had. I think one of the things that Max points out in the book, and it's something I said to my mates a couple of years ago, was let's not just rely on nostalgia mm. for our friendships. We have to make new memories. That's what we have to do as friends, make new memories. And just going to an ex-servicemen's club, Richard, means that you could meet people that you could make new memories with. Doesn't necessarily mean you'd sit yeah. there talking about your time in the RAF. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that. Do you, do you feel in any way, shape or form that you have close mates that you could rely on? If you're feeling low, if you're feeling vulnerable, if you're feeling sad, definitely. But those friends are because they're sort of spread around the the country, whatever. They tend to be, it tends to be a phone call rather than a face to face. Um, when was the last time you organised? When was the last time you said to one of them, right, this weekend in September, I'm coming down. We did have a we had a gathering in May. Um, oh, not long ago. Okay. Yeah, and that was... That when was when before like, that? <laughs> <laughs> that was quite a while. <laughs> right, OK. OK, and Max's point is... Yeah, go on, Max. Go yeah, on. so to, I just thought of something because obviously we're talking about the RAF and there's a military analogy that was shared with me by someone who's got loads of friends. And so I said to them, it's a man with loads of friends, sees his friends all the time. And I said to him, like, how do you do it? And he said, well, my mates call me the Sherpa right? Like those Nepalese soldiers who carry everything up the mountain because I organise everything. But if I didn't organise everything, I'd never see them. And I just thought, what a brilliantly simple thing. Be the Sherpa. Like, that's a kind of, right. if I want to stand right. for what, one thing, be maybe it's Sherpa. that. Be the Sherpa. That's yeah. great. Be and the Sherpa. We can do that. And I think when it's difficult and our mates, because men can be a bit useless, don't play ball, that's when it's hard and we have to keep on doing it. But if that's one of the biggest things that made a difference for me, Richard, was was doing that, being that guy that goes first. But again, part of the cold masculinity thing is we don't want to seem to be needy, right? We Why should it be me? And I don't want them to know that we want to meet up because I'm fine by myself, actually, mate. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll be all right. And yeah. I'm not saying that's how you're thinking, Richard, but it's of how I was thinking at the start. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to be aware of... And overcome that. Yeah. Oh, really overcome that. They can't just be your mates, can they, Richard, if they're only there when things are good? 
Oh no, I I do have I do have good mates, and um, but I think it's that fact that you can't sort of nip around the corner and see them, or uh, and that that sort of closeness, that proximity to people, mm. as opposed to down a you know phone call. But then you which... need to do what you can, right? Yeah. Rather than yeah. lament what you can't, <laughs> right? So if if it was May the last time you saw them, then September sounds like a good time to see them again. But it needs organisation. It needs yeah. planning and it needs the ability to say it's it, how comfortable it is to say to your male friend, I miss you. I mean, how comfortable would you just saying that sentence? Um, I could say that to a couple of people, but I would feel very self-conscious. Of right, them. right, right. Therein lies some of the problems for us men, isn't it, Richard? Yeah. Another yeah. thing that made a big difference for me was talking about things that are hard to say. And yeah, I think it is a really hard thing to say, Richard. I, m I miss you. Uh, I went, there was one friend I had who, um, I won't name him, but it was someone I got on amazingly well with. But I'd never really told him that I, I liked him. <laughs> and he never told me either. <laughs> and I was like, I don't think he even realises we're good mates. And like uh, the analogy I, I think about is it, like, often with male friendships, it's like we're playing a computer game, but we're stuck on the same level. So what's the cheat code to go one step up? So I went to the pub with him, and I think we were watching the football or something. And I said, on the, I said to myself on the train on the way in, I, I'm going to tell him that he means something to me. And so I said, after we had a pint first, I should say. But I said, mate, I've been reflecting on this, and I made a list of who, people I, you know, I'm fondest of in, in the whole world, male friends-wise, and you're absolutely in the top three or four. And I just don't know if I behave like that's true, but it is the case. And it was a bit awkward, that conversation, for about 30 seconds as we sort of, you know, manned it, manned it up. <laughs> but then after that, because it had been confessed that we liked each other, it was just different. It, it, was, it was closer just by virtue of having the conversation because we had now admitted what we were both feeling but couldn't bring ourselves to say. Did we do it in a very awkward male way? Yeah. <laughs> Did it take three pints of Amstel? Other <laughs> lagers are available. Yes. But, you know, it's just a small thing. And I think a big message, if, if you're a guy listening to this today, I don't want you to think we're trying to turn you into these new age man, softy, softy all the time. Someone said to me, you need different tools in your toolbox to have great conversations mm, when, and yeah sorry go on Max. and i only used to have t one or two but i related to every man in my life with banter right i could so try and give advice and solve problems had no other tools that limits you in the sort of conversations you can have so it's just about what other tools can i bring here uh to get a, a different outcome it's really i've got a mate i'm going to i'm going to say his full name <laughs> his name's andy holland and every time we speak to each other at the end of the conversation, we tell each other we love each other. Oh, wow. But I actually say, I love you. And I actually, some, weirdly, I might, we might often say, I love you, bruv, because we have to add the bruv bit <laughs> yeah. on to the end of it to bruv make it crucial. more masculine. Yeah. To make it more masculine. But we always say we love each other. Always. Wow. And we've been mates for 30 years. And he's like, he's as geezer as you imagine, right, this bloke. But he is, you know, he's, and there's, there's a three, there's, yeah, there's, yeah, there's other guys as well. There's another guy called Terry Betts, who's an incredibly close friend of mine. I know I could say anything too. But it's important just to say, I mean, Richard's really fascinating there. Richard, thank you for speaking to us here on Five Live. Thank we, you very much. Really appreciate that. R um, Richard, Richard, before you go. Yeah. yeah. When you put your phone down here. Yeah. You know what I'm going <laughs> to say here. Organise it. I think it. I do, yeah. Yeah, organise it. Have yeah. something to look forward to. September's like, what, six weeks away, seven weeks away, yeah. right? yeah organize it and then put it in you have to put it in otherwise it just drifts and I'll send you a photo please. yeah send us a screenshot yes, Richard. yeah send us a screenshot richard <laughs> definitely take care my friend really good thank to you speak very to much you. love you richard right. oh so good um so many texts max uh, really excited to read this book nihal personally feel i've lost a lot of good friends just through drifting apart and not really talking been through some really tough personal times with mental health and put so much strain on my relationships where I would have loved a couple of male friends to reach out to. Uh, Ryan in Northampton said, Nihal, I think we can track all of this back to the male conditioning. We're told not to open up. We're told as boys we should be hard and resilient. I think that will change. My sons are being taught something very different, but it will take time to come to the fore. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I'm mm -hmm. telling my son exactly that. Hi, Nihal. I'm 52, married, with, but with few close male friends, around three. 
I've always preferred the company of women, and this is still the case, and doesn't cause any issues in my life. I don't feel lonely, thanks, Tony and Warminster. I think that's a really good point as well. You know, having female friends as a, as a and I don't have it. And, oh gosh, I can't remember really any like. And I used to have lots of female friends, and uh, I wish I had more. Richie in Hull says, interesting debate, gentlemen. I have zero close friends and prefer the thinking space that solitude brings. One burnt through disclosure to others. It does make one reluctant to engage. And uh, this text said, I'm a sales manager of 20 years experience. And as a gross generalisation, in my experience, women make better salespeople. I'm convinced it's because they are expert communicators through friendships, able to listen, empathise, ask insightful questions, understand another's perspective. Whereas men's friendships are less about talking and more about doing stuff, climbing trees, playing football, <laughs> and are consequently poor communicators. Oh, Max is forever climbing trees. Yeah, Good grief. You I see don't him. Stop. Oh, I don't Call stop. Call me Tarzan. <laughs> exactly. Um, let's very quickly go to the cricket, see how England are doing. Ellie Aldroyd is at the Oval. Ellie. Well, we've just seen a glorious four from Moe and Ali, but uh, that kind of shot has been uh, very, very hard to come by for England. They're 34 for five, and we are in the 11th over, so at least they've got through 10 overs. It was looking touch and go at one point. But five wickets gone, absolutely brilliant bowling by Jasprit Bumrah, who's taken four wickets in five overs and conceded just nine runs with two maidens. Outstanding from uh, Boomer, the test captain. Uh, but Moeen is on five, Joss Butler is on 14. Four ducks in the England innings so far for Roy Root, Stokes and Livingston, who was bowled around his legs. Absolutely horrible dismissal from Liam Livingston out to uh, Boomer. England's lowest ODI score ever is 86. So keep that in mind. Uh, we could be watching, keep, you know, having a, a, a rewriting the record books again here. But uh, absolutely fully on top India in this game 34 for 5 England oh, in the 11th God. over oh, God. wow uh, okay um, God, there's some uh, strained male friendships going on in the England team by the sounds of it Max yeah. um, okay solutions right um, we need to get some solutions before that though, I want to speak to Andrew Greenway who's project development manager Andy's man club brilliant Andy's man club actually Andrew good afternoon Hi, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. So tell us then, give us some solutions here for how men can forge these friendships. Well, like I said, working for an organisation like Andy's Man Club, um, as many of your listeners will be aware, we host weekly peer-to-peer -peer support groups that are open to any man aged 18 or over to come and talk about literally anything. And we do have guys that come along to those groups because of the issue of loneliness. They maybe don't see guys between Monday to Monday. You know, all our sessions take place on a Monday evening. Some of those guys don't see anybody else between those times. What's really encouraging, though, is the the friendships and the um, you know the the, the the brotherhoods that are forged as a result of coming along to our sessions. Not only do they get the opportunity to come along and talk openly and freely, you know, which is something that men, as you as you've alluded to previously in the conversation, struggle with and can you know have real difficulty with. It also then means that the opportunities that they get beyond that increase so heavily you know some of the things that happen as a result of men coming along to an Andy's Man Club is you know they can sit in a room start to share some of their common interests and as a result we now have guys who play five-a-side football together on a weekly basis we have guys who are part of a camera club together guys who are part of a walking club all sorts of different activities that take place really organically just from literally guys sitting together in a room and sharing a common interest um, and, and that really does help widen their circle that in turn then helps to improve all sorts of manner of other things that are going on with them. You know, obviously we we know about the situation with men and their mental health currently and the, the situation obviously with the suicide rates of men. Widening that circle and, and hoping, helping to reach out and, and decrease that loneliness can be massive for those guys. How do you overcome the embarrassment, Andrew? We always strip it back. We always sort of say, as, as far as we're concerned, if you walk into one of those rooms, you know, you'll know that we don't have any sort of, signing process you don't have to give us any details whatsoever you don't even have to speak so by getting through the doors of that room you know immediately that you're in a room with other like-minded people the whole reason that those guys are in that room the whole reason that they've attended something like andy's man club is because they are in a likely very similar situation to yourself so there's no embarrassment to be had um you know that there's no situation that you can't deal with through walking through the doors of one of those clubs mm, um... again through the fact that guys can just sit and say absolutely nothing as well and ease their way into it. They can sit and listen to somebody else share an experience and go, actually, 
that's just spoken to me. What that guy's been through is very similar to what I'm dealing with in my life. And that in turn allows them to be encouraged to open up. Um, Max, you overcame your embarrassment by writing a book about it, presumably. Yeah, I, I really went for the nuclear option there. Um, <laughs> it's a bit of a double-edged sword being the, the face of having no mates now. <laughs> That's my life now. People come up to me in pubs and go, you're the bloke with no mates. I'm like, yeah, okay. Can I have a beer or... Um, but yeah, Andy's Man Club is great. I went to a men's group, not Andy's Man Club, because um, uh, there's lots of them in, in the North Lesson in, in, in the South. But I went to one, and one of the rules was no banter. And I think what's great was it forces you to communicate in a slightly different way. And um, you can just try out slightly new ways of being with each other. And I just think that's really positive. So try different stuff. Be the Sherpa and be intentional about it. Go out and um, take control of it because it can be simple. Brilliant. Listen, uh, Andrew Greenway is Project Development Manager at Andy's Man Club. Thank you very much indeed. Richard in Harrogate, thanks for getting in. Everybody's text, everybody's tweeting me. Thank you very much. But I reserve the biggest thanks of all for the man who started this conversation, Max. What a pleasure, mate. Thank you so much for having me. Brilliant hour. Max Dickens, Billy No Mates is the name of his book. The voice of the UK. This is BBC Radio.